Okay, um, so first I'm going to talk a little bit about things that you can do um, related to ABA at home. And I know we have some outpatient parents and some residential parents. So for outpatient parents, these are things that you can do at home with your child, um, just kind of on a regular basis. And then for residential parents, these are things that we talk about as um, your child comes home for a break or you're getting ready to transition your child back home or to a new placement, things like that. So, um, and then also while you're here visiting. Um, so one of the most common strategies that we use in ABA is reinforcement. And so that just means that we are um, trying to increase desired behaviors and um, providing some type of reinforcer after um, the behavior occurs. And so we want to do that immediately after the behavior occurs to make sure that they're more likely to do that in the future. Yeah. Um, so that immediately follows the behavior. So we can use reinforcement um, at home for really any behavior that you want to see more of. It might be related to chores around the house. It might be related to completing homework, um, making sure that you're, if you want them to play outside for a certain amount of time before they um, get to play video games, those types of things. Um, so we want, we want to make sure that they understand what they're getting the reinforcement for. So that's kind of one of the most common mistakes that we see even in residential with our um, paras who are implementing reinforcement with our students, um, making sure that they know exactly what they're earning that reinforcement for so that they know what behavior is expected of them um, prior to getting that activity or um, sometimes we use like edibles, food, candy, but we try to mostly stick with activities and um, other things that they can earn that are more tangible. So um, reinforcers can change frequently. So when you're doing this with your child at home, um, just remembering that whatever it is, they might like it today. Um, and it doesn't necessarily it's, mean it's going to be a reinforcer tomorrow. Um, so kind of asking your child um, if they're nonverbal, you can do a just kind of quick reinforcer assessment where you give them three options and let them pick um, what they want, what they want to play with, what they want for a snack or whatever you're using. Um, they might take an item if it's given, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're motivated for it. So this is something that we see a lot um, with our students, especially those who are nonverbal, is um, we'll give them the iPad as their reinforcer. They love their iPad, um, so it is a preferred item, but it doesn't necessarily increase the behavior because it's not strong enough to make them actually want to um, engage in behavior to get it. Does that make sense? Um, so one of the most simple things that you can do at home is a token program. And these are a type of reinforcement system that help you just kind of keep track um, and provide reinforcement more frequently, but not um, giving an actual reinforcer every couple of minutes. Um, so we use a lot of token programs in um, the school where we're really trying to make those tokens um, become reinforcing. So it's kind of, you can kind of think about it in terms of money. Um, you earn money, you earn money becomes reinforcing, um, not because the money necessarily means anything, but because that means you can turn around when you have enough money and buy something that you want. Um, so that's kind of the same thing with token programs. So they earn um, tokens. We have some that are puzzle pieces. So they're building a puzzle. Um, and then when their puzzles complete, they get to turn that in um, for a bigger reinforcer. So we give tokens immediately after those behaviors that we want to see. Um, and then we give them pretty frequently in the beginning to kind of teach them this is what happens, um, this is what the tokens mean, just really kind of teach them how they earn it. And then you can start gradually giving less tokens. So if you were doing this um, for say chores or um, even like toilet training, we can use these for. So um, giving them a token every single time they use the bathroom and then 
kind of as they catch on and as they learn, you can start giving them a token every other time they use the bathroom, things like that. Um, so we want them, um, as soon as you give them a token, tell them why they're earning it. Um, hey, you great job doing your, making your bed, um, here's your token. So that they understand this is what I earned it for. So that next time mm -hmm. they'll be more likely to do, make their bed. Um, when you do that, it really can be anything. Um, some of them in the school we have that are a little more fancy that we've kind of created for those kids who have um, like specific interests. We have some Spider-Man token boards. Like I said, we have some that are puzzles. Um, for some kids, we can even just draw them on a piece of paper. So they don't have to be anything fancy. You don't really need special materials. Um, you can draw some squares out. Carla, if you wanna to go to the next slide, here's an example of one. Um, so this is a really simple one. You can um, cut out the little Lego pieces if they're interested in Legos. Um, you can even use actual Legos, things you have laying around the house um, that are preferred for your child. So um, when you're doing that, just keep it in mind, like you don't have to create anything fancy. You don't have to go buy anything. Um, you can literally just make it stars on a sheet of paper, stickers, anything like that. So, um, and this is a very simple intervention, but it's also um, good to remember that as a parent, um, nothing is as is as simple as it seems. So <laughs> um, it can be really easy um, as a staff um, or as a therapist, they're pretty simple um, to give to clients and students. Um, but when I'm trying to do this at home with my own child, it's much more difficult because it's your own child. So. Um, if it's not, if you're trying to implement it and it's not as simple as it sounds, um, it's probably because it's your own child, but um, they are pretty fun and, um, sorry, I had a question come through. Um, okay, so um, somebody asked if it works better for younger students um so how does it not turn into let's make a deal um so like the child figuring out um that they have to put together an entire puzzle before they can go to the next level so um that's a really good question and um the kind of let's make a deal part is where we try to avoid there's kind of that like reinforcement versus bribery and where do you draw the line um, so bribery is something that we do not want to use. And that's kind of that, let's make a deal. You do your laundry and I'm gonna give you time on your iPad. So here's your iPad. And then when you're done, you need to do the laundry. Um, so that's kind of like giving that reinforcer before the behavior happens. And that's where it turns into bribery. Um, so there's really no guarantee that they're actually going to do the laundry after they get their iPad. Um, so the token programs work, um, they can work with older students, they can work with young kids. Um, and it really is more about making those tokens reinforcing also. Um, so those puzzle pieces or the Legos or whatever it is turns into receiving this is reinforcing to me. Um, so for this, this student um, who's very reinforced by money, we could, we could do um, dollar bills. And we do have some token programs that they earn like fake money, um, which is a little more concrete. So they know I'm gonna earn um, the vending machine at the end of the day, I need $2 for the vending machine. And so they're earning like fake quarters throughout the day. Um, so it's not necessarily, it doesn't, I'm trying to think of how to, <laughs> um, so it's more like this, the token itself becomes reinforcing. Does that help? I don't know if that fully answers your question. Okay. Um, and then if you have questions um, after this, like about your specific child or your specific student, 
Um, I think Carla will give you my information. Um, some of you already have my information and you're more than welcome um, to reach out to me and we can kind of chat like specific students, if that helps. Um, okay, so the next one is behavior specific praise. So this again, um, is just something that you can kind of use to help build that momentum for behavior at home. Um, children love attention. So we like to, we want to give our kids lots of attention um, for those behaviors that we like and um, the, those that you wanna see more often and then not to give as much attention to the behaviors that we don't want to see. Um, so sometimes it's really easy. And again, as a parent, way easier said than done. Um, we want to give a lot of attention to that. Hey, you said, please, you asked for more, you um, are asking appropriately. And then when they're um, getting to get something, um, it's very, very easy to say, stop, hit, stop hitting. <laughs> um, but we want to make sure that you're giving that um, specific praise for the ones that we don't, mm -hmm. and then just kind of silently redirecting when possible those behaviors that you don't want to see more of. Um, trying to catch your child being good as often as you can so that you can use that behavior specific praise. So um, what that means is you're just clearly stating what you like about the behavior. So instead of saying, um, good job, you're saying, hey, I really like the way that you're sitting with your feet on the floor at the dinner table. Um, and you're using your fork appropriately instead of just saying good job eating dinner so that they really know like these are the specific behaviors that um, I like and these are the behaviors that I want to see more of. Um, and then it's most effective any type of praise um, or behavior specific praise is most effective effective when it's given four times more than a corrective statement. Um, so that means if you are correcting them hey, sit down on your bottom with your feet on the floor. That's a corrective statement. And then you wanna give four um, like positive statements in between that before you give another corrective statement. So that's just making sure that your ratio that your child is getting is way more positive um, than to correct it. And um, this is kind of, on the same lines of that, um, making sure that we're saying things in a positive phrase instead of that, no, stop, don't. Um, so instead of saying, stop running, don't dump your toys, you can say it's time to walk um, or let's only take a few toys out at a time. Um, so kind of rephrasing it in, this is what I want you to do versus you're doing this wrong. Um, this is what I don't want you to do. So they can learn quickly by you telling them no, they can learn I'm not supposed to do this, but we're not really teaching them what they can do instead. Um, and then these are just a couple of resources that have some really good information about reinforcement and like things that you can try at home. Um, so I don't know if Carla can share these links with you guys um, and they are helpful. Thank you. <laughs> um, they can be some helpful, just kind of um, different terms and things that you can use in ABA. Since I didn't have a ton of time to go over a lot of things, that kind of helps explain things further. And that is all I have. Um, and if you're needing the PowerPoint afterward, um, you can just go ahead and email care at heartspring.org and we can um, email you the PowerPoint and it'll have those resources um, or we can just email the resources over to you separately as well. All right, the next section, um, Emily and I are both going to put together. So it will be us bouncing back and forth just because a lot of things, there's definitely a lot of differences between PT and OT, but there's definitely some that carry over as well. So we're gonna talk about motor proficiency throughout the lifespan. Um, when, we, when we think about 
OT and PT interventions, um, there's definitely different times in life where that can happen. Um, I think if you were to kind of take our typical caseload over an outpatient, we're seeing the largest amount of children that we serve are between the ages of two and five, but the need for PT or OT isn't necessarily determined by an age, it's determined by the child's participation. So um, it really, we can serve, we call it womb to tomb, um, we can serve the whole lifespan. So we'll kind of discuss how some of these motor proficiencies that develop early on, or maybe don't develop early on, have an impact as that child is gonna age. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is tummy time. Um, as a developmental OT, I put so much importance and emphasis on tummy time and prone work. Um, so why is this important? We hear about tummy time with our infants and then it just kind of fades away and we don't, we, we associate tummy time with infancy, but tummy time is critical again through the lifespan. So the things that um, tummy time can help build or just being prone on your stomach builds core strength and stability. So that ability to hold your head and balance when you're sitting and standing is built in this position. Um, it contours the rib cage. I put this one at the top um, because I just think this is so important and we don't think about um, how gravity is impacting our body. But when we're on our tummy and that that force of gravity is impacting us from a different angle and we are having to resist it and building that core strength, that's where we develop that contouring of the rib cage that's gonna give us the ability to take deep breath for the rest of our life. Um, specifically thinking about breathing and eating or breathing and walking, those are things that happen at the same time in lots of dynamic positions. So that rib cage contour is critical for, to be successful for the rest of your life. It works on neck and spine extension and building up those back muscles that support us in standing. Um, it develops shoulder strength. It develops arches in our hand. So as babies, our hands are very, very flat. There's not a lot of contouring here. They're actually kind of these little pudgy, fleshy things with like, I call them like carrots coming off the top, but an adult hand is very contoured and very narrow with this really nice deep arch. That happens when we're putting force through our hand on a flat surface. Um, it, tummy time integrates primitive reflexes. So we're all born with these natural reflexive patterns that are going to set us up for success for motor pattern later on in life. And in order to get those motor patterns to be um, volitional to a child, so meaning they can move it on purpose, that baby is born with reflexive movement that does it on accident and helps them plan those motors. So they need to integrate those reflexes, mean, meaning they need to go away and that motor pattern needs to become voluntary. So being prone on our tummy helps to integrate some of those things. It also helps to promote visual tracking and coordination. So when you're, again, down on your tummy and you're working in a different, a different position from the force of gravity, that baby's really gonna have to work on stabilizing their head so they can turn side to side. Um, and it's gonna make those eyes come together and have to track. And we see that also in um, throughout the lifespan at different times when we work on that prone, prone position as well. Um, Aaron, before I jump over, do you have anything to add to that? That pretty much hits it all. Okay, Just it's really never too late. It's never too late. If you if your baby didn't tolerate tummy time in infancy, it is not too late. We can still get those kids on their tummies. Um, there's a couple of little activities here that you can do, working a puzzle, reading a book, watching TV. A lot of quiet time can happen in tummy time because that body is working so hard. It can be really calming for the brain. And so if you have a little one that you're just like, boy, he will not or she will not calm down, they're bouncing off the walls get them on their tummy, give them a quiet activity, really engage that brain in a different position and you'll see their body quiet down. Um, it's recommended that 30 to 60 minutes a day of 
cumulative time on their tummy. Um, so if, if you're new or you haven't been successful in this area before, five minutes and work your way up. So with at-home intervention, we kind of chose to take it this route of what we're most commonly seeing come into the clinic. And like Emily said, it doesn't necessarily matter the age of the kid, but more what their limitations are and their current abilities. So in terms of some of those things we're seeing, we created a list of common caregiver concerns. Over on the left is balance, strength, and then the coordination and motor planning piece. And that's gonna be more of what kids are coming into physical therapy for. And then over on the right-hand side, you'll see fine motor coordination, bilateral coordination, and independence and self-care activities. And those are gonna be more of what kids are coming into occupational therapy for. Um, when we talk about these things, each are, there'll be a slide with detail for each of these and different activities to help engage as well. If you have any questions about any of the topics we're talking about or activities, feel free to drop them in the chat box and we can answer them as we go through the slides. All right, so when a kid presents with balance deficits, you'll see them known as the clumsy kid on the playground with their friends. They seem to trip a lot. They run into things. You're always worried about if they're going to get hurt next. Uh, another big one is that they can't stand on one foot. You see this a lot with dressing. So if a kid goes to put on their pants, can they stand up to put their pants on or do they have to sit down or hold on to something? Um, having a hard time going up and down the stairs, especially with one foot on each step. Uh, they're going to trip and fall really easily, especially when they're outside or changing surfaces in the house. So maybe they walk great on the tile and then all of a sudden they go over to the carpet and they fall or they're out on the playground and they're running and all of a sudden they just trip and fall out of nowhere. And a lot of times these kids can be known as more of the lazy kids. And that's just because kids are smart. They know what's hard for them and they're gonna avoid what's hard for them. So if they're having a really hard time playing on the playground because they don't feel safe and they're falling a lot, they're gonna avoid the activity. So then it just gets projected that they're lazy and not that there's actually underlying problems. And then the next big thing is strength. So when we talk about strength, that carries through the lifespan as well. So in babies, you're gonna see a lot of strength problems come into place with delayed gross motor milestones. So that's gonna be if you're at your pediatrician office and they're asking you, do they roll, do they sit, do they crawl? All of those things that are typical developmental progression and you're answering no to some of those questions, that's more of a flag that maybe they're a little bit behind on something. They have uh, difficulty holding their head up and then they also may have a hard time moving their limbs. So reaching, kicking, anything in all positions. Uh, as they get a little bit older, you'll see some poor posture. So they're gonna slouch over. They're gonna have lordotic. They're gonna be very lordotic. So that's in that picture on the right on the bottom, how his back really sways in. That tells us that he has a really weak core. And then you'll see knee hyperextension. So that's knees locked really straight, sometimes uh, curving back the other way. And then that top picture is what we call the C curve position. And that tells us again that there's a lot of weakness going on in that core. So if we think back to the slide that Emily just talked about before in terms of tummy time and importance of prone work, when we're not seeing those things happening, we're seeing a lot of the kid in the top picture on the right. Uh, and then if they haven't met age appropriate gross motor milestones, so say they're two or three, not jumping yet, four or five, not hopping on one foot, if they're having a hard time even standing in general, walking in general, running in general, a lot of those can be strength deficit signs. If they have a hard time getting up and down from the floor. And I would say that's an important one as you get older, it should be pretty 
easy to transition from sitting on the floor to standing. But if you're seeing them have to use a lot of external support, if they're really struggling or huffing or puffing to stand up, that's another sign. And then as well as being floppy, for lack of a better word, is how we like to describe it. So that's just their everything is just kind of blah when they move. So they don't really have a lot of control of their limbs. When you pick them up, something like that, you'll notice that there's just not a lot of bulk to it. And it's like they almost melt through your fingers. So that's another sign that there's some strength deficits as well. There we go. So we threw this slide back in here at this point, because like Aaron just really highlighted, well, strength is going to be one of the first things that's going to be addressed with um, as far as like a dysfunction standpoint, it's gonna be part of the first um, blocks in the domino effect that we're gonna notice. So um, Carla, I'm gonna have you toggle back and forth between these two slides because what we wanted to highlight is not necessarily the words, it's the pictures. So let's go back to the slide before that Aaron had. And I want you to think about your children. <laughs> it's funny that he's even got like a little video game. This is such a common thing. And I also hear parents say they cannot sit in a chair. They just slide out of the chair. I can't get them to stay in. I, they don't like to be at the table. They're just sliding out of the chair. Well, in this position, the way that this child is in that C curve, he's not using his tummy to hold him up. He's literally bent himself in half to where his rib cage is now sitting on top of his pelvis. And that's really the only way that his head is still up. If we were to take away that rib cage, he would just flubber and he'd have nothing there. So we need him to engage that core and then engage that core will pull that spine up into a proper sitting position. So when we, if we toggle down to the next slide, we put those babies or those children on their tummy in and we either do that quiet work, maybe they're on their tummy on a scooter board and they're working that body in the opposite direction. So that way when they do sit in a chair, they can sit upright. So you might not be thinking to yourself like, oh, well, my child can run and oh, well, my child can do all these things because they're five, six, seven, teen years old. Um, but look at them when they're sitting and then really evaluate, oh, are they, maybe there is a little bit of strength issue there. So that's those two pictures I think are really important. I'll let Aaron kind of continue from here. Perfect. You can go on to the next slide. So this next piece is going to be the coordination and motor planning. So that's really going to highlight the ability for a child mm -hmm. to coordinate their body and get their arms and legs to do what their mind is wanting them to do and especially do them together. So when there's coordination and motor planning problems, uh, I have a lot of parents tell me, well, they can't pedal a tricycle, they can't pedal a bicycle. Every time we put them on, they want to ride it. They just don't know how they're supposed to move their feet. Um, they'll have a hard time imitating any gross motor activities. So maybe it's that you've seen them do things sporadically while you're not paying attention, but then if you ask them to show you again, they don't know how to do it because now their mind is involved in trying to get their body to do it. And that's where some of those dysfunctions are falling. Uh, as they get a little bit older, you'll see things like they're unable to complete jumping jacks just because they can't coordinate those arms and legs together at the same time. They'll have a hard time skipping or galloping or playing hopscotch just because it's requiring the brain to now coordinate what the arms are doing, what the legs are doing, and crossing connections so that things are working in opposition to one another. They'll have limited object manipulation skills. So we like to refer to these as the ball skills. So they'll have a hard time throwing, tossing, kicking, and catching a ball. Uh, and then again, they could trip frequently, run into things a lot just because they don't really know where their limbs are in space. So through these next couple slides, I went ahead and highlighted some activities that you can work on to help address each of these dysfunctions. So that way, if you do request the PowerPoint from care team, you'll have different 
uh, examples and activities. So when we think about balance, there's a lot of different balance interventions that there are. So sitting versus standing, do they have problems keeping their balance while they're sitting in a chair or is it more when they're on their feet? Uh, static versus dynamic. So that's going to be, are they having a hard time staying in one spot to stand up or stand on one foot while they're in one spot? Or is it as soon as they start moving, they start falling? And then double leg versus single leg. So are they having a hard time with two feet on the ground versus one foot on the ground? So for sitting balance exercises, um, that's over there on the left side. There's different positions that you can put a kid in to help encourage that. And a lot of these balancing components are really going to encourage strengthening of the core. So we very rarely see a child, even an adult for that matter, in terms of physical therapy, come to physical therapy with just one deficit. So most of the time you're going to see some problems with balance and strength and coordination. And a lot of these exercises are going to work on, um, the whole picture. So uh, sitting balance, you can do different things like sitting on a ball, sitting on a couch cushion, um, reaching while they're sitting, make them turn their trunk, all the things like that. And then standing, they can stand on a pillow, stand on a balance board, stand on a couch cushion, anything to help throw their feet off just a little bit. Uh, static balance exercises are going to be the stationary where you're standing in one spot. So again, standing on a pillow, couch cushion, balance board, anything that you can think of to set under their feet. Uh, dynamic is going to be more of that moving throughout different surfaces. So that rather that's walking across pillows, walking in the grass, a balance beam, walking on a line, anything that just involves movement with balance. And then double leg versus single leg. So with double leg, it involves two feet on the ground. So you'll see a lot of commonalities between these exercises, but this is more of just to help you think for your specific kid, if you're noticing uh, more deficits in one area versus another, help you think through what kind of exercises are most appropriate to them. Um, so again, when you're standing on two legs, anything on a balance board, pillow, et cetera, single leg is going to be more of that standing on one foot, going up and down the stairs. Um, and then anything that really involves while you're just supporting your weight through one foot. So like kicking a soccer ball, anything like that is really going to help encourage some of those skills. Um, and then mix it up and make it fun. So there's a lot of different positions that you can do. If you change the foot position, like feet together, one foot in front of the other, eyes open versus eyes closed, all of these will hit a different component of that balance system. So then strengthening interventions. I went ahead and listed uh, some samples for each of the big groups that we work in. I'm not going to go through specifically what each of these are. It's more of just a reference for if you're noticing some dysfunction. Um, our big ones, again, are some core <clears throat> strengthening. And like we've mentioned several times now, prone work and tummy time are fantastic. Um, so a lot of those can be plank, supermans, just playing in that position, and then building up some glute strength. So bridges, squats, a lot of things that uh, adults will do as well. Abdominal work is some of that, the sit-ups and crunches. Uh, lower extremity work in general is more of going to be that jumping, step-ups, wall sits, squats. And I'm a big fan of animal walks. I have a couple listed over there on the right hand side, but another way to make it fun, make it seem like a game is to do animal walks. So that's crab walks, bear crawls, um, something that's more enjoyable to a kid rather than let's sit down and work out for 10, 15 minutes. And then a coordination and motor planning slide. Again, I have several examples <laughs> listed down just for your reference later, but really these are gonna be any activities that are involving <clears throat> both hands and legs at the same time, um, trying to coordinate them in, together and opposite. So 
catching, kicking, throwing, tossing, um, jumping jacks and different variations. So maybe they have, a, they can do normal jumping jacks pretty good. Can they do with their arms and legs kind of going the opposite way? And that's in that picture with the girl wearing the blue shirt. Uh, practice pedaling a tricycle, jumping in all sorts of directions. Um, and then with all of these, and especially the coordination and motor planning, definitely don't be afraid to provide help. So give them instructions on how to do it and feedback throughout the whole thing. Show them how to do it. Don't just tell them how to do it. Um, put your hands on them, help them if they need a hand, if they need you to move their arms for them while they're figuring out the activities slow it down and break it up step by step. So that way they are able to be successful. And then uh, I've always loved to put a mirror in front of a kid if they have a hard time coordinating some of these exercises because sometimes that visual feedback is enough to help them self-correct. And the big things for PT at home are to make it fun. So I have just a couple different pictures of how that can look. So make it an obstacle course, turn it into a game, involve the whole family. Uh, there's different, like if you see the top picture on the right, they have a whole obstacle course set up outside, which is a lot of thought and it's awesome. And the kid probably had a great time doing it. Whereas the bottom picture on the left is another obstacle course through the house. And all it is is painter's tape on the ground to give them a line to walk on, give them X's to jump to. And then again, animal walks can be a blast for kids. There's different uh, animal walks, yoga cards, things you can find online that really help to make this enjoyable. And then I just went ahead and listed a couple resources at home. Pink Oatmeal is a really good one that has a bunch of different exercise ideas broken down into similar categories that I talked about today. Cosmic Kid Yoga is actually themed yoga classes. Um, there's like a Frozen themed and they're working on all of the above of everything that I just mentioned. Some of that balance, some of that strength, some of that motor planning, but because it's themed and like a story throughout kids really seem to like it the inspired treehouse uh, and dino pt also have a lot of exercises to follow some of these similar things and then as well as just getting them involved in recreational sports or even just playing outside playing with their friends but definitely individual sports will help build a lot of these deficits that we're talking about. So like swimming, dancing, gymnastics, as well as some of those team sports. Okay, so we'll kind of um, jump over and we'll talk about more of the fine motor aspect and the OT, um, the need for OT. So when we're talking about fine motor, we're talking about specifically those really coordinated movements within our hand. So um, my friend Spock up there is demonstrating uh, what separation of sides of hand means. So not only does your child, would your child have a <clears throat> dominant hand, right hand or left hand, but they're actually gonna have a dominant side of the hand. So these three fingers, thumb, pointer, and toe man are our working fingers. These two over here, ring finger and pinky, are our stability fingers. So typically, when we're doing things like holding a pencil or buttoning, zipping, um, those, those really controlled things, opening packages, food packages, you're going to primarily be using these three working fingers, and you're gaining stability and structure from your hand, uh, or, sorry, stability in your hand from these two fingers down here. So I like to reference Spock when we talk about that. Um, some of the activities that you could do at home to promote separation of the sides of hands are a lot of tong or tweezer activities. So um, if you come to my room, I have like a um, ice cube tray or a mini muffin tin that's got like lots of little different compartments and organizers. And we'll spend time picking up objects and releasing them into those containers. There's a lot of board games too that are specifically targeting that tong use that are really fun for kids to play. So anytime that we're using that squeeze 
tongue like movement that's going to be building the muscle down here in your thumb and it's going to work to promote strength in that separate in that skill of separation of hands um, you can also take marbles put them on top of golf tees rolling play-doh into small balls and just any of those kind of smaller activities that are going to be motivating for your child to work in that repetitious manner to build that strength um, the other aspect of fine motor that we do too is to develop that hand arch that we were talking about um, with that prone work that can be really important. So if you're, we can do the tummy time, we can do prone. Um, bear walks like Erin was mentioning are also really good for that hand arch. Cutting with scissors. I like to get out thicker paper. So something like a index card or even a cereal box um, has that nice cardboard like texture and cutting through that is going to be <laughs> exercise, literally exercise for that hand arch development. Um, other activities you can do cupping, so scooping up water and dumping it or maybe in a sensory bin or a dirt bin, we're scooping and cupping our hands to develop that arch um, and then picking out objects from Play-Doh or Theraputty just to get that resistance and build up those muscles as well are also really good activities. Oh, we have a question here, let's see. Question says, our son always showed ambidextrous. Um, oh, it looks like grandma was too. She had to think about stirring a pot and which hand she would use. Um, so this is a really good question about handedness. So when we think about handedness, um, I want you to focus on tool usage and developing a dominant hand for tool usage. So if that is a writing utensil or fork and spoon, maybe it's a hammer, scissors, um, those tong things, if it requires a tool, I want you to encourage your child to use one hand. Um, and the reason being is because of that strength component and the motor proficiency that goes along with that. If your child is having to learn how to manipulate a tool between right and left hand, quite frankly, they're only gonna be able to put in about 50% of effort because they have two hands that are doing it. So let's really target that effort into one side and get them proficient with one hand and tools. When it comes to things like gross motor play, you know, I'm not as picky. If your child uses their right hand to hold a pencil but can shoot a basketball with their left, that's okay because a basketball is more of a gross motor movement or even throwing a baseball, those type of things, those are more gross motor and they don't require as much strength and dexterity as the tool usage does. So a really good way to, to assess if your child is right-handed or left-handed or has a tendency right hand or left hand, you're always gonna take that tool and you're gonna put it in front of them on a surface, like on a table maybe, you're gonna to try to put it in front of them right at midline. So right at their nose or belly button is their midline. And you're just going to watch and see what hand they pick it up with. If let's say it's a, a pencil and you guys are drawing a picture together, um, or let's use crowns for example, because crowns are different colors. So you're gonna present your child with a crown right on the table, right in, at midline. They're gonna pick it up with whatever hand they want, but because it's at midline, it's an equal opportunity, right hand or left hand. They're gonna grab it with that hand and start coloring. You're gonna encourage them to take the hand that's not holding the crown and support the paper so that that hand has a job. As they're coloring, they're gonna get fatigued because they've been used to switching hands. They're gonna feel that fatigue and they're gonna to want to switch hands. At that point, you go, oh, it, blue crown is really tired. Blue crown needs to take a nap. Here's a red crown and you're gonna present them with a different color at midline on the table, okay? So instead of them being able to switch that crown back and forth as they get fatigued, you're gonna remove the, that crown because it's tired, it needs a nap. Present them with a new one. 
they have now another opportunity to choose what hand they're gonna use. They pick it up. Hopefully they would pick it up with the same hand that they did last time, but it's now a new opportunity and they're gonna color until that hand gets fatigued again. As soon as you start seeing them switch that hand, oop, that crown is really tired. It needs to go take a nap. Here's a third crown. Okay, so you're just gonna continue to redirect that hand switching by presenting a different tool and giving them a new opportunity. And as you work in that and always putting it on the table because you don't want to influence what hand they're going to pick it up with, you should see them have that tendency for right or left instead of that thought of being ambidextrous. And you should be able to shape that into that more proficient one hand use with tools. Did that answer your question? That was, a, that was a great question. Awesome. Okay. If you guys have any more questions, just jump in. I have no problem switching gears. I want this to really make sense to you guys. So um, I love questions. Okay. So moving on, more fine motor coordination um, is an in hand manipulation. So I, I call this squirreling. Um, it's the ability to move and position objects within the hand without having to use another hand to do it using. Um, Oh, I like that. Let's use the smart hand or the strong hand. I like that. Yep. Some kind of way. And again, you know, back to kind of, um, I'm going to jump ship a little bit here. When Ashley was talking about um, shaping behavior by positive reinforcement, this is perfect. You're not saying, oh, no, we don't use that hand. You're saying, let's use our smart hand, you know, or let's use our, I call these the go fingers. Let's use our go fingers, right? One, two, three, go. And so you're kind of using that same language to say right hand or left hand or, you know, whichever one the child's tendency. So I think that's great. That's great positive reinforcement. Okay, back to the in-hand manipulation. So children, and this is actually, this fits right in with your question. Children who don't have a dominant hand, if they're switching something back and forth, I don't, I'm looking around to see if I have a little small object. Ah, my son's, my son's figuring out clippers. Okay, so what they're gonna do in order to get this out and flipped around and in my hand, I have a right hand dominance so I can do all that dexterous mo movement. If a child doesn't have that manipulation or that dominance in their hand, what you're gonna see them do is they're gonna recruit the other hand and they're gonna position it for themselves. Okay, so we wanna see that confidence build up in their dominance and their manipulation skills. So that's called squirreling, being able to move that object around in their hand solely with that hand. So what can we do to promote some of those things? Um, there's these really cool crowns out there. They're called flip crowns. They're one half is you know like red and the other half is green. Um, and so you can sit there and you can flip that, that pencil or that crown back and forth in your hand so it kind of looked like this right now i'm coloring with the green side and then oop i flip it again now i'm coloring with the red side if you don't have access to flip crowns that's okay go get a pencil sharpen it on both sides and then you just sit there and you flip it back and forth flip it back and forth um that's kind of fun sometimes to play like a tic-tac-toe game with yourself you know this side of the of the pencil is O's and this side of the pencil is X's. Um, and you can kind of play different games like that. You wanna promote that in-hand manipulation by having your child pick up really small objects. So they're going to, let's say, put 10 M&Ms on the table or 10 dried beans on the table. And you're gonna pick them up one at a time, move that into the palm of your hand and they're gonna hide it there to go pick up a second one, move it into the palm of their hand and now they have to hold all 10 items, which if your child is learning this skill, one or two is probably going to be their max. But you want to be able to get them up to like, you know, five or 10 in their hand without dropping those pieces that they're counting. Okay. And then we reverse that and we have them retrieve it from the palm of their hand, bring it back up to their pointer finger and put it down on the table. Um, if you're if your child likes to eat M&Ms and that's not motivating for them to keep them in their hand, 
excuse me, a really great thing to do is piggy banks and counting money because we pick them all up off of the ground and hold them into our hand. And then we slide that coin back up to our fingers and we insert it into the piggy bank or into that vending machine. And maybe that's more motivating, right? Um, I actually have a child who's motivated to go get a water from the vending machine. And so that's how we work on that squirreling. Well, they have to put all their money in their hand. <laughs> it's like a dollar fifty, I think in our vending machine and I make them pay for it in dimes. So they get a whole lot of practice holding that in their hand and squirreling it up to the front and putting it into that vending machine. Um, kind of in line with that in-hand manipulation is thumb opposition. So it's ab the ability to turn, rotate, and move that thumb to touch each finger and across the whole hand. So if your child can not do this, we probably need to work on thumb opposition. Okay. You can work on counting all of your fingers. You can make your thumb do slides. I'm a very visual person. I apologize. I keep looking at myself and, and talking with my hands. This might be distracting, but we're talking about hands and I think it's important to see it. So you can work on your thumb slides all the way down your fingers. That's a really good stretch and activity. You can put stickers on their finger and make them touch the different stickers so that it's very visual. When we pull in that sense of vision and those eyes to help us with motor, that can be um, very successful. You can have them seal and press Ziploc bags together. Again, rolling that Play-Doh into small balls on their hand is another really good way to get that thumb opposition. Um, and then my favorite activity ever is just to peel and place stickers. Um, I, think, I think it looks so simple but you can take a piece of paper or like on this little toilet paper roll, you've got a whole visual of different circles or, or animals or letters or whatever is motivating to that child. And we're gonna peel off a sticker. So that requires two hands to work together. because One hand has to hold the paper, one hand has to peel the sticker. Then visually we have to track and say, okay, where's that circle on the paper? Where's the letter I? Where's the lion? You know, whatever it is that you're matching. Your visual system's engaged because it's now scanning and tracking that paper. And then we bring that sticker over with our pincer and put it on the paper. And we've got thumb opposition, bilateral coordination, and visual motor. It's a beautiful activity. Okay, moving on. So move straight into bilateral coordination. Um, I want you to think about bilateral coordination in two scopes. So it could be both hands moving together to do the same action. So thinking about, oh, sorry, we got another question here. I love these questions. Um, ooh, now that's a great question. So if our son just rolls small pieces of Play-Doh on his own, is he trying to relax or is he really working in that area? Um, I don't know. I think, I think you could probably answer that question better than me, honestly. Um, it could be both. You know, it could definitely be that, that that can be a very melodic kind of soothing, same motion. Repetition can be very calming. And so over and over and over, He's sitting there kind of calming himself down. There's a little bit of sensory that's coming back into it. The tips of your fingers are very rich in nerves. And so a lot of input can come from the tips of those fingers. There's a, also a whole lot of innervation to our thumb joint because our thumb joint is one of the most freely mo moving joints in our body. It's a very unique joint. And so him rolling that thumb back and forth, he's getting a whole lot of information from here and a whole lot of information from here, and it can bring some calmness to that body. Um, I bet you he is pretty strong in thumb opposition if he's doing that over and over. So I think that's great. Do you, Lisa, do you mind if I ask, do you notice that he's calm during this activity? It's been a long time since I've seen him do it, obviously, but when he would do it, um, I th he would kind of like almost um, zone out or, you know, just like sit there and 
and do it. And then eventually they'd get to be smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. So for mm-hmm. part of me thought, okay, maybe he's like almost self therapizing his hand, you know, or hands, depending yeah. on which hand he was using. Yeah. Um, because it seemed like he like wanted to do it you know it's like he needed that at that moment and then and sometimes it would last a while like he would sit there for i don't know 10 minutes or so just just doing that and again like kind of zoning out and kind of staring off or else watching what he was doing and then he would put down that ball then of course he'd have to pick up you know a pinch more and do it again and again throughout his you know childhood really and I, I haven't seen him do it in a long time, but, you know, again, we haven't seen him in a long time either. So I don't know if he still tends to go to something like that, you know, and, and that's why I was like, all right, is he, so which, which way are we really leaning here? Is it like calming or is he trying to focus on something mm-hmm. or is he just, you know, using his hand because he wants to work, you know, those muscles or, you know, does that mean then he needs more? you know, OT at this time, you know, for fine motor. So I could never really figure that out. Sure. Um, What a great question. I mean, and what an observation from you as a parent looking into more detail of your child and getting to understand your child better. Um, I really applaud that. So I have a couple of thoughts. Um, You know, you mentioned like, as he did it more, the balls got smaller. So that tells me that whatever his motivation is, he got better, right? He got more proficient and he was able to get smaller and smaller and smaller. The smaller an object, the more dexterous we have to be and the more proficient we have to be. So, you know, maybe he didn't start this activity because he thought, oh, my thumb's weak, but it did benefit him regardless. So he, you're noticing that those balls got probably smoother and smaller and more perfect in their sphere um so because he would start off at like pea size and uh-huh. then they would get down to such a teeny <laughs> tiny little ball you could barely even see it you know when he set it on the table then but yet he knew it was there and the real because tiny ones were more round and more perfect where the pea size ones were a little more oval <laughs> shaped you know yeah. yeah that's funny um you know it from this conversation, I would say that's probably more of a sensory thing for him. He probably did identify that, again, like we talked about, he's going to get a lot of input from that thumb joint. He's going to get a lot of input from the tips of his fingers. And he, like you said, the word zone out. Well, again, if our body's having to, the harder our body is having to work to produce a motor plan. So we talked about that in that prone position, right? If we're prone, we've got all of those systems working again. Well, he might not be prone, but he is really isolating movement down to specifically this joint with a little bit from these three. That's going to take a whole lot of focus. And so if he's in a busy environment and he can't focus, he's learned that, boy, I can zoom in and I can shut down my world for a moment by hyper focusing on that motor. So um, my guess is he's probably has put that strategy in place from that sensory perspective or the focus perspective, but is getting wonderful benefits from a fine motor piece too. So what an interesting thing. Um, okay, let's, thank you for joining us, Glenn. Um, let's jump over here. We'll talk about bilateral coordination. I think I only have one or two more slides. We'll talk about a little bit of self-care and then more conversation. Let's, let's do it. This is great. Um, so the bilateral coordination piece, um, as I was saying before, there's two different ways that that can look. You can have two arms moving in the same manner. So that might be, um, you know, pushing furniture or throwing and catching a ba- uh, basketball, right? Both hands are going to push out, both hands are going to capture. Um, so that's where your two hands are working together, or you have bilateral coordination in an opposing manner. So that would be tearing a paper. One arm's going to come towards you. One arm's going to go away from you. So a push-pull type manner, um, or maybe it's coloring with one hand, stabilizing your paper with the other, eating from eating with a spoon in one hand, holding the bowl with another. So it's the opposing kind of thing. 
So that's exactly what we're gonna do. If a child struggles with bilateral coordination, we're gonna put them in those positions to, to target either moving together or moving in op opposition. Coloring and painting. You wanna make sure that the non-dominant hand has a job. If your child has a tendency to switch hands, the non-dominant hand or the hand that doesn't have the tool has to have a job. If it's not employed, it will steal the job from the other one. So you can gently put your hand over the top of theirs and help them hold down that paper, help them stabilize. You know, if you're standing at a vertical surface, like an easel, helping them stabilize that easel while they're coloring. If they're painting, then that non-dominant hand is actually gonna hold the bucket of paint or hold the little cup of paint so that it has a job and it won't steal it. Um, bubbles is another really example of that, a really good example of that. You're gonna hold the container of bubbles and then you're gonna use the more dominant side to hold the wand and blow those bubbles. Um, sorry, we had another question. Uh, musical toys. So talking about, now this could target both. If you're using symbols, you've got two hands moving in the same direction. If you're talking about maybe like a triangle, you'd have one hand holding the triangle and the other hand holding the tool to make that music. Um, other gross motor activities to build bilateral coordination um, in any manner, whether it's together or in opposition. Twister is really, really fun because you've got to really coordinate lower extremities and upper extremities as well. Um, playing catch. So you could use Velcro mitts if your child isn't really able to capture a ball quite yet that's tossed to them. Um, you could play catch with a basketball, catch with anything really. Um, jumping games. So jumping jacks, again, our body's going to be moving in a synchronized bilateral manner. So both hands are going to do the exact same act action. Um, hopscotch, jumping over objects, etc. Clapping games or finger play songs. So back in the day when we all used to sit out on the playground and we would play those slap clap games, those are excellent for bilateral coordination. And then always Simon Says, because then you can just be as creative as you want to with your child. All right, so we'll talk a little bit here. We've spent most of our afternoon or, or morning, I'm sorry, um, talking about motor proficiency, but I did wanna put a couple of slides in here for self-care because that's another one of the big reasons why um, families come to see an occupational therapist is to help with those self-care tasks. So I'm gonna talk about two principles that I use in self-care, um, kind of keeping it at that superficial level. And then if you guys have more specific <coughs> questions, we can talk on the Zoom or um, you can absolutely email me um, Carla can give you my contact information. Okay, so when we're thinking about self-care in, um, in the sense of getting dressed, I love to use backwards chaining. This can also be effective in hygiene tasks like bathing or um, brushing teeth. Any of those activities that have sequenced steps, step one, step two, step three, step four, you can work with this backwards chaining intervention. So it's a strategy that's going to fade the caregiver's assistance and increase the child's participation. So you're going to provide your child with hand over hand assistance for all of the steps of the task, but allow your child to complete the final step. So what that's gonna do is it's gonna make your child feel successful immediately because they're gonna do one thing. And that one thing is at the end of the activity. So your child, you're gonna say, I want you to pull your shirt down over your tummy. They're gonna follow your directive to pull that shirt down and guess what? It's done. And you get to say, yay, good job. You put on your shirt, we're finished. So they get the immediate reward of just being done with that activity and they've, they've helped you with a step. So as they become proficient in that final step, then you're gonna backwards chain the second to final step and let them work on that. And then you're gonna backwards chain to the third from final step. So I just kind of quickly put together what this might look like for a shirt. So imagining that the steps of a shirt is over the head, through the arms, down over his stomach, your child's gonna start by pulling the shirt down over their stomach. Yay, good job you put on your shirt. And we leave and we go do the rest of our day, okay? 
then it's going to be, okay, you're gonna push your arm, your second arm through your shirt, then pull it down over your tummy. And we're gonna backwards chain from pushing our first arm, then our second arm, then our tummy. Backwards chaining it to pulling it down over their forehead, or I'm sorry, from like their forehead to their neck, then their first arm, second arm, then tummy. And finally, we're gonna get that child to where they can just, boom, is you hand them a t-shirt and they can put the whole thing on themselves. Um, as you're now analyzing the steps for this backwards chaining, I want you guys to eliminate any closures and fasteners and buttons, okay? That's not the final steps of a shirt because that's, if we're not able to put on a shirt, we're probably not able to button. So let's start with the easy things first. Um, great question again, Lisa. So she's asking if this is done through proficiency or do you keep repeating each step for a week or three days? Uh, the, the timeliness for when you would backwards chain to the next step. So you're, I think what you're asking is when do I know to add the next step, okay? That's gonna be when you see your child gain the confidence or um, willingness might also be the other key word here to complete what's being asked of them right now. When you start to see your child anticipate that it's time to pull that shirt down over their tummy and they're doing it without you even saying anything and they're just over and over and over and they're reliable in that, it's time to add that second step, okay? You wanna see them, and in, in, like I said in the very beginning, you're, you're still providing hand over hand assistance. So they're still pulling that shirt over their head and they're still pushing their arms through the sleeve. It's just, you're really doing most of the work because your hands are on top of their hands. So as you go to backwards chain, all you have to do as a parent is watch your child start to anticipate and complete those steps independently. And then you just slowly start letting go and fading back your assistance. Because their hands have been going through that t-shirt motion the whole time, they already have the motor plan in their mind because it's just being done for them. And so it'll be really easy and really intuitive for you to fade back on that next step and then just follow through with it. Does that kind of make sense what I'm describing? The timeliness of this is really just dependent on how, how quickly your, your child picks it up. Um, with something like dressing, you're probably only getting practice at dressing twice a day, you know, changing into jammies and changing into day clothes. Um, you, can, you could speed that up if you're willing to help your child change, you know, the more that they change their clothing throughout the day, the more practice that they're gonna get at that. You could play dress up for a week and see if just more repetition will help get them those steps faster. Um, so just, it, it's hard to target how long it would take um, because it just, it just matters how much practice they're getting. Okay, so that's backwards chaining. The other principle or intervention that I use when I'm talking about self-care is shaping. So shaping is a strategy to build confidence in success um, in a desired area. So we're gonna shape them. The other word for shaping is successful approximation. So you're just going to, to provide positive reinforcement when you see your child get close to that activity. So I think about shaping for things that children um, really have a difficult time tolerating or avoid. And a lot of times I hear pottying on the toilet, trying new foods, um, tolerating brushing their teeth. So those are the things that we need to say, okay, like this child, it's not that they don't know how to do it, it's that they're unable to tolerate it being done, whether that's because of sensory or a bad experience. Um, the why really can matter on the um, specifics of that particular child, but in the principles of shaping, the why isn't necessarily important. It's just that they're having a hard time doing it. So we're going to shape them into this activity. So I have a visual over here for um, trying new foods from a shaping technique. We call this the food hierarchy chart. Um, and in my second example down here, so let's say your child is really struggling to try a new food and they're very resistant to anything new being put in their face. 
Um, so we're going to shape that. So the first expectation is that your child can tolerate that new food just sitting on the table, not on their plate, but just sitting on their table in a bowl. Uh, or maybe it's even on your plate and you're sitting next to them, okay? If your child can tolerate just that new food being around them, good job, buddy, like mom's trying this new food. You can just kind of model that through that. Then, then you're gonna start by just having the child tolerate the new food on their plate. They don't have to interact with it, but they do have to continue eating their portion of the meal. Once you see that they're able to tolerate those new foods being on them, then we're gonna shape their behavior and start getting them to physically interact with that food. So when we think about a child who struggles to try something new- Turning away from it. So looking down on it, I release it here. It goes off in that direction. Say that one more time. I'm sorry, I missed your question. Okay, um, I apologize about that. If that was a question, will you type it in there? Because I think my audio uh, interrupted your audio. Okay, so we're thinking about a child who has a hard time inter or introducing new foods. Um, the biggest reward for them is going to be that food disappearing. So I want you to get an all done bucket or a trash can and have it next to your child while we're doing this activity. So they can tolerate the food on their plate without them interacting with it. Now we're going to ask them to touch that food. So they're going to maybe have, let's say, three bites of this new food or five bites of this new food, remembering that it disappearing is going to be more rewarding than anything else. So they're going to pick up that food and put it in the all done bucket. Good job. Nice working. You touched your food. You can put it all done now. That food's going to disappear off their plate that stress and anxiety of something new and challenging is going to be eliminated. Everybody's happy because they just complied with your expectation and they're happy because it's gone. Okay. So now we're able, and again, the, the timeline for this is so individual to your child. Um, what I can encourage you is that you're never going to fail by going too slow, you you might fail if you push them too quickly. Okay, so we're going to build that trust over time. Okay, so now they can touch it. Now we're going to ask them to kiss it or smell it, bringing it up close to their mouth, but they don't have to put it in there. So we're going to pick it up, bring it up to our mouth. We're going to smell it, kiss it, and it goes in that all done bucket. Okay, then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna lick it. So we're opening our mouth, we're introducing that, but we're not chewing it, we're not putting it in there. We're gonna lick it, put it in that all done bucket. The next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna touch it, smell it, lick it, bite it, and spit it out. You're gonna give your permit, you're, you're gonna give your child permission to spit this food out because it needs to be gone, okay? This is something new. This is something that we're only doing this because all the other techniques have failed. So it's okay in a very structured way for your child to spit their food out. Once they're doing that, you can play, you can start playing games and shape them to keeping that in there longer. You can have them move it from the front of their teeth right here where they're biting it back here to the molars before they spit it out. You can touch it, kiss it, lick it, bite it, chew it one time, then spit it out. Then chew it 10 times and spit it out. What's gonna end up happening is you chew, as they start to chew that food, our swallow is a natural trigger. So it's gonna slide on back down there without them even realizing. If you have them start chewing 10, 15, 20 repetitions, there's not gonna be anything left in their mouth to spit out, okay? And then eventually we can say, touch it, kiss it, lick it, bite it, swallow, chew it and swallow it into your tummy. By this point in the chart, they're pretty much over those first five steps and they're just gonna start putting it in there because it's not a big deal anymore. And they're gonna flow right through that hierarchy chart. Um, you can do the same shaping kind of thing with a toilet. And I have an example there too. Um, you know, you enter the bathroom, you stand there for three seconds, you touch the toilet and then you leave and then you sit on the toilet fully clothed, then you leave. So that shaping technique really is just getting that child to follow an expectation of yours and then building that confidence by moving that threshold just a little bit further each time. Okay. <laughs>
questions? Okay, well, if no one has any questions, we're a little bit over time, but this was good. Um, and um, if you guys need the PowerPoint or have any follow-up questions, you guys can email um, the care team and we will get you in contact with Emily, Erin, or um, Ashley, depending on your question. And um, yeah, if you are hopping on to the parent care group, um, we'll see you there. Bye.